Um, so I'll be talking just a little bit today on um, some recent progress we've had with Infinite Ops. I'm also tagging on uh, disjunctive programming, which is a package really led by uh, Hector Bettis. That's now uh, he's now at Relational uh, AI. They're really big proponents to jump over their MathOpt interface, so that's been kind of fun. So we'll just go into it. Uh, so Infinite Opt, uh, I'm the Infinite Opt guy. So that's what we're going to talk about first. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this little thing I do, I'll give just a few introductory uh, slides. So uh, Infinite Dimensional Optimization. It has going to have kind of kind of four core elements that I'm going to using my own definitions that we're going to uh, talk about. The first is that of infinite parameters. So these are essentially parameters that index your variables. Think of time, space, uncertainty, and how these can index the decisions you want to make. And these are typically over a uniform, kind of a continuum, giving you sort of a continuum or infinitely many decisions you have to make. OK, uh, it can also have uh, then infinite variables. These are the variables that are indexed by the infinite parameters. So think of like a variable that's a function or indexed, if you will, by time and, and maybe uncertainty in this case. OK, you can have differential operators as well. In general, most often we'll be thinking of like partial derivatives or uh, regular derivatives. I take it with respect to time or, or, or whatever. And you can use these uh, to create like uh, PDEs or ODEs or whatever you have going on. And then we can have uh, measure operators. So think of like expectations or integrals, uh, risk measures, and how these can kind of summarize over these domains, time, space, uncertainty, that sort of thing. Um, so what I kind of developed was sort of a unifying way of thinking about these types of problems with these sort of four building blocks and how when we do that, we can capture um, formulations and dynamic optimization, uh, space-time optimization, stochastic optimization, it'd be combinations of those, and kind of just one abstraction to sort of represent them all in the same place. Uh, and this was kind of fun because it can help us kind of capture a wide envelope of different uh, applications and start to kind of cross things over in some different uh, ways of doing it. And so this is what Infinite Ops uh, seeks to do. Um, and so it's implemented in, in Julia, of course, that's why I'm here. And it extends a jump to have these sort of four core uh, modeling elements. Some things that I think distinguish it from some of the packages out there is for these types of models, it's quite performant in expressing these types of models and transforming them. It also has very extensive documentation. I don't think I can quite match the thousand plus pages that Oscar and others have put together, but several hundred for sure. Uh, and then I would argue it gives us a pretty um, intuitive syntax. So we can directly embed expectations and uh, derivative operators to really compactly express uh, PDEs and int uh, integrals and all kinds of things in, in a very nice uh, way that Julia lets us do. And it's been uh, used by more people than I originally thought it would be, which is nice. One of the more bizarre applications I heard of, or a guy's cool applications I heard of, was talking to some evolutionary biologists that ran across this to start doing like um, optimal path problems to try to figure out how, if you solve an optimal path problem, how that would compare to the, uh, the paths chosen by animals as they evolve and that sort of thing. Unusual, but kind of fun. Uh, and then the nice thing about using Julia, of course, is as we get uh, to play of macros, we can have some really nice compact uh, syntax. It basically, just takes the math and I think gives us a code interface that's pretty close to what the math looks like, uh, which has helped me a lot in my teaching uh, to uh, basically take undergrads and have them solving like dynamic optimization problems in a few days. So I can actually take uh, my, my process control course I teach, I'm a chemical engineering professor, and we can uh, solve like model predictive control problems in one lecture, and most of the undergrads seem to get it, so it was kind of fun. Okay, uh, anyway, so last year, let's go talk about some progress now. Last year I talked about how I kind of came up with a hacky little nonlinear interface that would allow us to have first class support for nonlinear expressions in jump. For those that are familiar with jump and its sort of legacy nonlinear interface, you would know that if you had to do it extensions, 
it was very painful and not readily possible. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, so I came up with my own sort of nonlinear object, NLP expression, uh, that InfinOpt used to represent nonlinear uh, expressions. And then these would get translated to a Julia uh, expression tree that could then be taken into jump with the raw expression uh, interface. Had a few little hacks in between to make it work. And uh, it worked, yeah. So basically we had this kind of tree structure and uh, got going. The, the big takeaway from doing this, though, was it allowed us to use like the at constraint macro, the at objective macro, to define affine quadratic and nonlinear expressions all in one place. You didn't have to have the special NL macros, which are not extendable for extensions anyway, um, and allowed us to do that. And we could do deletion and all kinds of, of cool things and get first class uh, support. Uh, the update now, as uh, Oscar is gonna talk about later today, I believe, um, he's been working uh, a lot on a new interface in Jump uh, using this nonlinear expression object, which is, gonna, which is hopefully going to allow us to have first class support for nonlinear expressions in Jump directly that is extendable and can be used by uh, packages like mine. Um, so I've been working on sort of a pull request to try to try this out and see what happens. Really cool thing as we've done this though is we've been able to take away more than 2,000 lines of code, simplify the code base quite a bit, which is nice. Uh, another thing that's happened is with three uh, benchmarks I put together, we've been able to uh, drastically reduce uh, some of our model building time and get rid of a stack overflow error from some recursion things. So that was nice to get rid of as well. So this looks like a pretty big win, and I think the future looks pretty bright for nonlinear jump. I'll leave Oscar to talk about uh, that some more later today. Uh, also, just a quick update. Last year, I talked about this big overhaul of essentially our whole data structure to allow for more general uh, transformations of problems. So essentially, the idea is infinite ops should serve as a way to represent infinite dimensional problems. Currently, we're sort of married to doing um, discretization type uh, solution methods working on a more general interface to do other types of things is still under work, which is, as it turns out, to do a fundamental rewrite uh, takes a while. So we are, we're working on that. All right, shifting gears just a little bit, uh, disjunctive programming. So this is uh, most been developed by my colleague, uh, Hector. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about that. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this notion of generalized disjunctive programming, this mostly comes from chemical engineering where we just weren't quite satisfied, I guess, with disjunctive programming, so we had to change it a little bit, mostly to handle uh, nonlinear uh, modeling a little bit better that comes up in our uh, application areas. Uh, here, essentially, the idea is you have these disjunctions. So essentially, um, you have a collection of constraints with this indicator variable uh, that's a Boolean, true or false. And if it's true, the constraints are enforced, and if it's uh, false, they're not. And you have a disjunction of these, so you typically only have it such that only one of these is enforced if you have several uh, dis disjuncts. So, well, this comes up often in our domain is expansion planning. So here I can build one plan to follow the constraints that come of that. Or maybe instead I'll build a whole bunch of smaller things with the constraints that come of each one of those. I'm only going to have the constraints enforced for each group if I decide to build the respective system. So this is uh, an example of where this uh, tends to come up. And we often have uh, logical constraints that use these indicator Boolean variables uh, to enforce a logic on uh, how we go about uh, building these things or enforcing these constraints. There's a nice implementation, PyOMO. Uh, it's not the most performant thing ever, but it has a lot of capabilities. And uh, disjunctive programming, which, my, uh, which I'm talking about today, of course. Uh, this is just basically the same thing. I'm still in some slides from Hector here uh, that basically gives the formal definition of what this is. I'll just skip over that, but it's there. Uh, a big takeaway, though, is the, the, the nice thing about modeling with GDPs is it gives us a nice general framework to represent um, decision-making with logic without explicitly using a bunch of big Ms and these types of formulations directly where we can just use these disjuncts to encode the logic we want to do in the propositions. And then we can apply general transformation techniques, kind of turn the crank, and convert these into MIPS. So one way to do that is you can turn the crank, convert it into a big M uh, 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 formulation, 
Or you can do a whole uh, formation, which is going to be in general uh, tighter, but introduce more variables. So there's just different uh, transformations you can do that have their pros, their cons. But the nice thing is you can have just one formulation in GDP, turn the crank different ways, and have different ways of solving the problem, different MIPS with different pros and cons. Okay, um, so this is a problem uh, that he has here. It's technology selections is a chemical process, again, I'm a chemical engineer. So we can have two different reactors we can make. If we have reactor two, we can have, then have two separation things that happen afterwards to separate the products that come from that. Uh, a thing my colleagues are working on is this idea of nested disjunctions. So you have here a disjunction, and inside this disjunct, this disjunct you have a disjunction. Basically, we can build either reactor with the constraints that come with it, and if we build reactor two, we can either build um, this separator or this separator. So have disjunct inside of disjunct. You could also reformulate this as just uh, a non-nested uh, disjunct, but he's uh, proven that if you can do nested disjuncts, you can get provably tighter um, transformations that happen as a result to get better relaxations. Anyway. So this kind of highlights uh, disjunctive programming where it was. Uh, so here you define a model, add in um, some variables that you want to use. You create uh, constraints that are going to end up inside these disjuncts here inside this uh, block. And then you can have this disjunct macro and kind of put them in this syntax. Not the prettiest thing ever uh, to represent that uh, inner disjunction. And then you can start to put more things inside of it. Uh, and then you can reformulate it here for thing of your choice. So this is where disjunctive programming was. Um, and I think this is just continuing the you know, syntax. Yeah. So we're doing nested, so we did the outer, and now we're doing the, the inner. I'm going to move on. Uh, but some key things that came up from this as I started talking to Hector was um, that syntax was OK. Still a little clunky, perhaps, relative from the math into how you put it in. Um, also, the way he had it implemented is it was just directly modifying the jump model as you would do transformations. So you could do like one transformation, but then if you wanted to do something else, you'd have to completely remake the model because it had a lot of destructive additions and uh, changes to the models that went to. It was quite uh, not very performant as a result. And so if you wanted to scale it to a large number of disjunctions, it would scale to like order n to the fourth or third. So not great scaling. Uh, I also, uh, as it will come clear in a second, wasn't compatible with infinite op, which is a motivation I had. And because of the limitations of jump, we couldn't do nonlinear stuff. But we've been working on a rewrite to address all of those things. So working on a new workflow, where <laughs> is basically what, how it works is we're going to make it so it works with abstract models, not just jump models. It'll also work with infinite opt as a result where we augment them in the extension field with GDP data, which gives us a place to store all the additional modeling elements that have come with a GDP representation. And then we can transform the model using a solve hook function that's built into it to intercept the thing, do the transformation. You could do it, call it as many times as you want to different transformations in a non-destructive way to the model. And we'll have a better syntax. And we've been playing around with a new nonlinear interface. We can actually support uh, all these different types of expressions that we'd want to do, especially as chemis, where we want to do nonlinear modeling all the time. So this basically is just a simple disjunct, and this is just code on the side to prove that it works. This is the ugly functional form. So this is just like the calling build constraints and all that sort of thing manually, but it shows that our code is currently working. I threw this together about half an hour ago, so excuse the, the roughness of the slide. Um, but this is where we want to go. So I'm halfway through finishing this. Well, basically what we're going to do is you declare a GDP model, have your variables as you would normally do for your model. You can create a constraint normally, but then you just add on this tag, like maybe called disjunct constraint, still name pending. And then what it'll do is it'll make it so it doesn't actually add that constraint to your model, it gets saved somewhere in our extension field. And then we can use those specialized constraints to be stored inside of disjuncts that we create inside of a disjunction. So they get kind of created in a special way that it doesn't get directly added to the jump model, but will get used as we uh, do the transformation and add and build our MIP. 
And this will allow us to resolve the model as many times as we want, as many different transformations as we want in a very performant uh, way that overcomes a lot of the previous limitations and gives us a much more compact um, syntax, which I'm currently tweaking, so this might change a little bit. That's, that's the idea. Yep. Uh, now tying this back into Infinite Opt, a thing I've been working on is what I call event constraints. If you want to talk about this later, I'm happy to. Basically what the idea is, we, is we generalize the idea of chance constraints, but to be used across multiple domains. So you could have like a time valued analog of a chance constraint over time or something to give you some nice relaxation things. I'm not going to spend time motivating that, but we can talk later if you're so interested. Uh, essentially what this led to though is, is it turns out these constraints I've been working with can be uh, formulated as an infinite dimensional GDP. So essentially here um, we have disjunctions now that are have in infinite dimensional variables inside of them or infinite dimensional constraints. And you can have infinite dimensional Boolean operators. Um, currently how, we ha how I handled this before is I would take my infinite model, discretize, then do GDP that works on, disc on discrete models and then do it. The problem with that is if I have some optimal control problem with say maybe like four infinite dimensional constraints, I discretize it over a thousand time points and I get 4,000 constraints to then do these formulations over. But if I could do this in the infinite dimensional form, I could have four constraints that I then reformulate and then I can transcribe and it ends up being much more efficient to do it that way. So for a new rewrite of disjunctive programming, it's going to make it so we can create a GDP model, but pass an infinite opt model, and then basically have the same syntax and we can take advantage of these performance things. So anyway, again, uh, syntax uh, being final, but that's, that's the idea. All right, that's some me, uh, some updates in a kind of a rambly fashion, uh, but that's, that's what I got. Thanks. So, are there any uh, any questions or joking? Have you thought about creating a yeah. kind of a set that is a like a set, so you can add like vector of high constraints kind of thing, and that would be one of the set that you can do everything in the multiple by that. Yeah. So. The question is, have we thought of just using MOI sets instead of, and go down to the MOI level instead of doing this kind of more at the jump level, right? essentially, right? Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, some of the motivations to the jump level instead is it's a little easier to kind of get our feet wet and to prototype. Uh, the other reason, though, was as we started getting to what we really care about, like these nested disjuncts and things, it gets pretty nasty to try to figure out how to represent that at the MOI level and then try to have bridges that work effectively and to call that. So trying to get that whole workflow to work effectively, perhaps it is possible. I couldn't quite figure it out. Um, and so to have a way that we could call different transformations by the user on the fly uh, over and over again in different ways and have nested disjunctions with like nested sets, I'm not sure how you would do that in MOI. So that's why we're not doing that. We can talk afterward, though. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a, approximately the, the same question. One thing I was wondering is, is the interface that you're doing at the job level easier if you want to interface with it in up? Yes. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier for one interface. And uh, I've always been interested in by how you combine two job extension. Because, for example, here you have a soft hook. But does it be up also have a soft hook? InfiniteOpt does not have a solve hook, so it's an extension. Because InfiniteOpt right, is based off, like, I think it's the only extension that actually tried to implement an abstract model, so it's its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, warning, you can do it. It's a lot of work. I'm not sure I recommend it, but I mean, InfiniteOpt is nice as a result. Whereas, yes, GDP is doing the idea of you just have extension data and you do the solve hook. If you had two extensions that try to do the same thing, yeah, that doesn't really compose. So this goes up to another question I had on my last slide I forgot to really talk about, was this idea of composability. Like, what are some better ways we could think about making it so jump extensions are more readily amendable to being composed together? It's kind of an open question, I think. And then one of the ways we recommend to extend jump, right, is you can add tags to like variables or constraints. 
So I'm, I'm using this right now of Infinopto in, as part of my rewrite. There's a number of situations where I have multiple tags, and then the combinatorics of different tags becomes a bit of a nightmare to kind of make a composite type. So coming up with a better way of handling that is also an open question. Yeah. Like in, in, in Polygon, we also use tags. When you say actually define a region, we know yeah. But I think now that with the instant tags, it's nice to say add variable x in just a free that x comma free. I don't know. Yeah, so you're not using like a set type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, is there any distracted programming and complementarity? Do you have any complementarity? So, complementarity. So complementarity of the package? Uh, Constraints in general. Yeah. Do you handle anything by complementarity constraints? Uh, so currently, the way this is built out is it, in theory, will accept abstract constraint objects. So I don't. I probably should be a little more judicious with my checks. Um, so if when you add that abstract constraint object ultimately to your jump model, if your jump model knows what to do with that, you're good to go. If it doesn't know what to do with that, I guess the question was, could you reformulate? Oh, could you reformulate in something else? I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Mathematically, yes. Yes, you totally can. Yeah. You, so the question might be, can you reformulate complementarity constraints into disjunctive programming or vice versa? First question: Yes. Is that, is that true? Yes. Yeah. yeah mathematically. Yes. Is, do you do that somehow? Is there any code that does? Such things in your scheme. Right, so, like, so, so the question is, is there a way, do we have code built in to like take, like, you specify a complementarity expression and then convert that into a DDP? Is yeah, that the question? Yeah, or vice versa? Yeah, so as we're building out some of these logical propositions and things, one of the operators we plan on supporting is complementarity. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Sure. We thank all of the speakers in this session.